Hi folks, welcome to the very first episode of The Clinical Divide, a brand new healthcare analytics news video series. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Campbell. I'm a Duke trained cardiologist, as well as the CEO of the healthcare startup company, Pacemate. These roles really put me in a very unique position. I understand the perspective of both sides, both the healthcare decision makers as well as clinicians. When these groups of very smart people don't see eye to eye in the real world, problems arise. The clinical divide can hurt morale, costs, and most importantly, outcomes. And that's especially true as healthcare undergoes the digital transformation that we're seeing today. So every week on The Clinical Divide, I'll look at the hottest stories from the world of health tech and medicine. I'll give you the news and then the insights that healthcare leaders and clinicians can both use to work and grow together. It's all about bridging the clinical divide. For our first story today, let's look at a company called Civica Rx. This is a brand new generic drug company that hopes to battle drug shortages and high prices. And here's what's really interesting. The Mayo Clinic, as well as Intermountain Healthcare in Utah and five other health systems actually formed and created Civica RX. No doubt that's an intriguing and potentially disruptive arrangement, but it could also become a source of tension. First of all, yes, there are drug shortages and that's largely because of limited generic competition. But should hospitals get paid twice? Once for providing care and again for selling pharmaceuticals to themselves and their patients or customers? And do we want a health system where a physician, a pharmaceutical company, and maybe even a payer are all the same entity? Here's why physicians like me hear this story and raise eyebrows. Civica RX goes a step too far in blending revenue generation and the provision of care. Sure, I think their intentions are good, but who knows how it might affect clinical practice. Health systems with a hand in a generic drug company need to consider this perspective and be sure to set up very strong ethical safeguards and standards of behavior. And they also need to let their physicians know that always quality care, patient satisfaction, patient outcomes is a top priority. Now let's shift to the direct to consumer genetic testing company 23andMe. This week, it's closing its API to most software developers. What does that really mean? This means that developers won't have a direct access to customers' raw data anymore. Instead, the tech companies will get broader reports and researchers and 23andMe and me investor GlaxoSmithKline will get the more important and richer and deeper dive data sets. No matter what you think of that decision, the lack of consumer outcry here offers a lesson for healthcare executives and physicians. Too many consumers either don't understand or don't care about the privacy of their genetic data. Well, newsflash, that's some of the most sensitive information there is. Healthcare leaders didn't really ask for these kinds of direct-to-consumer tests, but the fact is they exist and they're hugely popular and we have to deal with them. Now, healthcare organizations and clinicians have the unique opportunity to work together to build educational initiatives to help patients understand the privacy risks and rewards of companies like 23andMe. And who better than us to get the job done together? Finally, researchers from the University of Buffalo in New York found that the more women walk, the less likely they are to die of heart failure. This comes from a study that started in the early 1990s and tracked almost 150,000 women. Consider this. Heart failure is one of the top culprits driving senior citizens into the hospital emergency departments and causes them to stay in the hospital for days, if not weeks at a time. It's a huge financial burden on the healthcare system and treatments can be super complex. Some people may even require heart transplantation. The medicines for heart failure are expensive. The follow-up for heart failure is expensive. This study shows us yet again that a little prevention can pack a big punch. As a physician, this hits home to me. This really makes sense. We need clinicians to spend more time teaching patients how to live healthy lives, but to do this, we need support from healthcare institutions. Physicians should be rewarded for keeping patients well, and patients must begin to understand the importance of prevention and their role in prevention. All we need to do is invest more money and in faith in tech. We need more applications to encourage exercise. We need diet trackers. We even need more mobile sensors that provide insights and ultimately can modify behavior. Well, that's it for the first 
episode of The Clinical Divide. Please join me again next week as we continue to work together to bridge the divide between healthcare providers and administrators. For Healthcare Analytics News, I'm your host, Kevin Campbell. Thanks so much for watching.